Well, that was pretty good. We did good. <laughs> okay, welcome. Uh, lots of announcements here. I'll go through the list quickly here. Um, the rummage sale is this Thursday, Friday, 9 to 1, and Saturday, 9 to 12. And you could pre-shop, you know, you have that ability. You are members here, and there is a room full of wonderful treasures downstairs. And we thank everyone that helped. Kathy, do you want to say anything? If you go downstairs, you can see everything, and it's amazing what happens in four days because we didn't work on Tuesday. But I calculated in my brain real quick of the time that I know we've spent over 50 hours down there this week to get it to where it's at. But if we had to have the rummage today at sale, it would be ready to go today pretty much. So we're in good shape. Thank you all for your help. It looks wonderful. Please go downstairs, take a look after service. If you see something you can't live without, you can see Steve or I, and uh, we'll be glad to take your donation. Thank you very much. Um, the Pumpkin Fest is this Saturday and Sunday. There is a sign-up sign sheet in the back. We will be doing the pretzel necklaces, and I'm still not sure where we will be. Uh, we got a welcome, you know, we got one email, but it still didn't give us place where we are so as we get the next email we'll try to make sure by Wednesday hopefully we get it so that the people that have signed up know where to go to find us um, worship next Sunday will be downtown Evan City it'll be in front of the uh, fire hall there'll be chairs there or if you have a desired chair you can bring your own chair but it'll be there all the churches will be participating and if it's raining, it'll be at Westminster Church. Um, the bucket items that we're collecting are due October 6th. Um, this week starts Pastor Lisa's Brew Theology, which sounds very interesting. It's at the Home Barbecue Brewery there in Calorie on the Mars Evan City Road from 5.30 to 6. So. And this Wednesday, bells are at 5.30, praise team at 6.30, choir at 7.15. But if you would like to sing in the anthem, all the choirs, um, I'm assuming, are meeting down at Westminster around 6 o'clock. So some of us will go down at 6 o'clock to practice the anthem. If you'd like to join us, you, pardon me, 7. It's at 7, down at Westminster. We'll go down there. Um, and there's two, I'll put two of these sheets in the back. It has to do with um, Together We Are Stronger. It's the Keystone Working Group. It's about merging the conferences. If, um, there's a QR code on the back. There's a web page. Uh, if you'd like more information, I'll leave these on the back table and you can get that. And the other thing is, um, our walk on October 5th, it's a Saturday at 10 a.m. It'll uh, begin up here in the parking lot, proceeds, uh, it'll go down into Evan City and return back up. And if you'd like to walk, please sign back there so we have an idea of how many will be doing that. And you can pick up a flyer. It'll be in the back. Any other announcements? Amy. Okay. Uh, Piper will tell you more next week, but October 6th, Sunday, is World Communion and Neighbors in Need offering. And this year, the Neighbors in Need is Mental Health Justice for All, tied in with our WISE program. So the envelopes are in the back, and you'll hear more about it next week. Amy? Okay, so um, Trick or Treat, Trunk or Treat is coming up October 12th at Edco Park from noon to 2. Um, Cookies from the Heart, I will work on the list this week so you guys can start signing up. Um, I don't know if we're going to do that grant this year but with ingredients. I'll talk to Cindy. Third thing, people, I have now found four ceramic trees in the basement. <laughs> four. <laughs> Again. Avoid the middleman, bring them to me. <laughs> Thank you.
For some of you that don't know, Amy collects the ceramic Christmas trees. So if you see one downstairs that she hasn't already scarfed up, take it immediately and give them to Amy. <laughs> Any other announcements? I have two little uh, words of wisdom from children, um, a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old. And the first one is, if you want a kitten, start out by asking for a horse. <laughs> and don't wear polka dot underwear under white shorts. Let us begin to worship. The peace of God be with you. I invite you to share your sign of God's peace.
We come to worship Jesus Christ, the one we are called to follow. No, it demands our dedication and our energy. Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? We say, we worship Christ our Messiah. Please be seated while Diane comes up with the youth. Okay, I know, ask a kid. <laughs> I know more. All right, so I have this welcome. How was school this week? I forgot to ask. Good, we're muddling through. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good. You have no choice. <laughs> so I gotta do the best. Okay, looking at this, do you have any guesses what's in it? What'd you say? A bag and a bag. Just guess. Food? Doritos? Maybe? That's a good idea, building blocks. Okay, you need more information, right? So I'm going to pass it down and you can shake it. That's all you can do. Just shake it. Nope, hold it up here. And then see what you think. Any guess? A box. Any guesses? What's a box? A box, all right? Now this time, go ahead and you can scrunch it out and try to do that and see what you think. It's just a box? It's just a box. It's just a box. One of the building blocks, okay. A box or one of the building blocks, okay. She's, and you're right. I'll tell you, you'll get some of that when we leave here. Okay. You have to pay attention for two more minutes. All right. Well, Jesus, he has gone around talking to lots of people. And his disciples were real close with him. So they were taking a little break. So it was just Jesus and his disciples. And in our scripture today, and what we're going to hear about later on, is about that discussion. But the discussion sort of was like what I was... In, Jesus asked the disciples there, because there was all these other people following them. And Jesus said to his disciples, the closest followers, he says, who do you think those people say that I am? What do they say? Well, one of them said, they think you're Elijah. And the other one says, no, they think you're this great prophet. And somebody says, oh, I've heard they think you're John the Baptist. So Jesus said, okay. But then he looked right at him. So you're the disciples. He says, who do you think I am? And you know what they did? They had more information about Jesus than those other people. So they were able to say who they thought he was, and they were right. And by knowing Jesus better, they knew that about God and how much God loved them. So that's what we're doing today in what you do by coming to Sunday school and by coming to church. You learn more and more about Jesus, more information, right? You know, more information. And that's all that God wants us to do. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who teaches and shows us how to receive and share your love and help us to keep learning from him and about him. Amen. Now you may take this and share. <laughs> 
I want the container back and share. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Jesus, it is easy for us to say that we will follow you and then turn our backs and act as though our commitment to you doesn't mean anything to us. We ask for forgiveness for all our shortcomings. Give us courage to be your disciples who are actively sharing your transformative love. Amen. Receive now Jesus' healing love and forgiveness. As forgiven people, we want to proclaim our faith in Jesus through how we live our lives. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Lord, as we enter into this time of prayer, we thank you, Lord, that you have given so many people the skill to help so many children. Each one of these pillows cases will go to a person, a child, a little one who has lost whatever stability they had. Lord, we thank you that those children will be able to lay their head on a pretty new pillowcase. Lord, it seems so small, but each one of these has a potential to do so much good for children in need. We thank you, Lord, that each one of these pillowcases was made with loving hands, with people who were praying for unknown children, but knowing that children often get hurt in ways that we can't imagine. So we bless these pillowcases for the work. We bless these pillowcases for the ministry they're about to perform for those children who need them so much. And Lord, we come together today to worship you, to Remember that you are the one that's in charge of our living and life. You are the one that leads us onward and forward. You are the one, Lord, that keeps us mindful that we're not in this world by ourselves. We're not here to only work and to, for ourselves. We're here to work for one another because we belong to one another in your name and with Jesus Christ as our Savior. So today, Lord, we thank you for the commitment that you have placed upon this church, the commitment upon each person's heart to do what they can do, even though it seems mighty small, it's mighty big when we join in with you and, and the mission that you have for us. Lord, we thank you for for good things that are happening in our community. We thank you for family that's visiting from afar. We thank you for Dan, who is somewhere between the ages of 62 and 82. We thank you, Lord, for the life that you have given him and continue to give with him. We thank you, Lord, for the gardeners, not only the ones that keep this church looking good but from the outside, but those gardeners that work in the world to help out. We thank you, Lord, for the joy that each hand has in making things happen for not only our church, but for the community. Thank you, Lord, for those people you laid upon their heart to help with the rummage sale. Thank you, Lord, that they are making it happen. We thank you, Lord, that Glenn was out driving we thank you, Lord. We've been praying for him for a long time, and we thank you now that he's getting back to his normal life. And, Lord, we thank you that there's a firehouse with an open house, and we thank you, Lord, that, again, people are answering the call. But we do have concerns, 
There is a greater concern of our world, of our country, of our communities. Lord, so many people, so many of our, th of our actions need your touch. We thank you, Lord, that people are willing to step up, but Lord, we ask that you keep them safe. Be with Nancy, who's in the hospital. Be with um, Nancy Caruso's family as she has died just yesterday, and they're just adjusting to that reality. We have praise for Sharon and her cancer treatment. We also have concerns still being lift up, lifted up as she continues her living in life. And Lord, there were two young people 2,000 plus years ago who traveled in a, during a pregnancy and with a young child. We continue to ask for prayers for people who are continuing to travel. Our mode has changed, but traveling with an infant can be trying at times and difficult, and we just ask for safe travel. We thank you, Lord. For we are blessed among a uh, beyond measure. We are blessed in ways that we so often overlook. Keep us mindful of how you walk with us, how you hold us, how you cradle us through our living and our life. And we pray now in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson comes from the book of Mark, the 8th chapter, beginning with the 27th verse. I guess I got this turned on, right? Okay. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. 
Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite open, openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. You know, I, I sit here nearly every Sunday, and I watch what Lisa does, and I forget when I'm up here. Am I supposed to be there? Am I supposed to be here? And it's like, it doesn't really matter, does it? Oh, it does matter? Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So, in the past few months, my personal, personal spiritual life has had a focus on the first disciples and how they were humans, just like you and me. I've gone back and considered in the Hebrew scriptures and how human those folks were. Think about Moses, King David, Deborah, and so many more were just human, just like us. I'm not quite sure why this has become very important to me in my prayer life, but I just keep following the path that God has for me. So when I looked at this scripture, I looked at it thinking more about the disciples and how human they were. They were walking in real time. They didn't know about the resurrection. They didn't know about 2,000 years of Christianity. They didn't know about what the commentators would do to, you know, sometimes rip them apart. <laughs> they didn't know all that stuff, but they still kept taking a step after step after step. So thinking about them, my, I had the thought, have any of you ever held a firmly strong, immovable belief about a situation or about someone? Now, I wish I could tell you I never have, but that wouldn't be true. I can be as stubborn as the next person. So I was thinking about this and thinking about the disciples, and I got to thinking about, un unbelievably, the Steeler game last week. I don't know how, I, if there's a lot of Steeler fans here, but um, I watched that game thinking, okay, any minute now they're going to blow it. <laughs> it's this firmly entrenched thing in my mind of, okay, they're going to do really good, and then they're just going to let it go. Um, but I was really grateful they didn't. It was kind of a fun game to watch. But, you know, there's other things rather than just games, football games, just games, baseball games. Um, there's thoughts that we might hold about people and about who they are, that we get it in our head, that's who they are, and not able to move off of that. I got to thinking about other times, and I, I, I got to thinking about several um, women, they just happen to be women, uh, who I've worked with in my past life, um, who were victims of domestic violence. They, met, I thought of one in particular, she was brilliant, she was a psychologist, 
Um, she had a following with all these people who were coming to her for counseling. She came to me for counseling, and I'm like, okay, you know, how's this going to work? But she had this firmly entrenched belief about herself because she was in a marriage where her husband constantly belittled her. You think a psychologist would know better? Hey, we're all just human. We're all just human, and we let things get to us. And we sometimes wonder, how can a woman or a man stay in a domestic violence situation when it's so obvious that, that that's not where they belong? Well, I want to ask you a question. If you get up every morning and the first, one of the first things you hear is, you are worthless, you are dumb, you're never going to amount to anything, God doesn't love you, no one loves you, and you hear this every day, probably more than once a day, for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you tell me what happens to you. Firmly entrenched belief that I am that person that my partner tells me that I am. Hard to get, it's hard to get through that. Well, Peter, he was a fisherman, a laborer of the times that he lived in. And if we look back at the times that Peter lived in, it was in a culture where they were being oppressed, brutalized, heavily taxed, uh, where the Romans had all the power, and they didn't have much. And there was this thought with many of the early Hebrews at that point that we are going to get a Messiah, and that Messiah is going to be all-powerful, there's going to be probably a violent overthrow, and we're going to be okay again. So they had this image of a warrior, maybe a little bit like King David. And so, and again, if they had heard this over and over from their grandfather, from their father, from the neighbors, from everybody, they start, you know, you kind of start looking for that warrior messiah. And I, I do think that they, at that point, they probably thought, oh, if there is a war, it's not going to be pretty, but it'll be quick and it'll be okay. They just wanted change in their life. They wanted a change maker. And then this Peter, this ordinary fisherman, met Jesus. And you know what? Jesus did not carry a sword. He did not wear battle garments in whatever the time that they, where they wore. He was just a man walking around, talking to people, listening to people, honoring people, loving people. Um, I'm, I'm sure that he was charismatic. When you think about Jesus, you'd have to be charismatic to get a gathering the way he did and the way he still does 2,000 years later. But that warrior aspect that many people were thinking about, that perhaps Peter was thinking about, not quite um, what many were looking for in a Messiah. But somewhere, somewhere in Peter's relationship with Jesus, Peter discovered that Jesus was the Messiah. He wasn't coming with swords. He was coming in a different way. So think about some of the, the teachings that, her, that P Peter would have heard. The first shall be last. Well, that's a different concept, isn't it? The first shall be last. The, uh, the prodigal son being forgiven. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Think about the other brother. Forgiving just not once, but 70 times over. And that was just the beginning of what Jesus was hearing from, um, from Jesus, that Peter was hearing from Jesus. I don't know if I said that right. Here was Jesus as a Messiah. He was homeless, didn't have a synagogue. He was a teacher with very few resources. But he had the biggest resource of all, didn't he? He had God. He had his father. 
So Peter and all of the disciples who were following him, and I don't mean just the 12, I mean, you know, all the others that were following him, had to make a decision. Are we going to let go of this image that the Messiah has to be a violent warrior with, you know, with sword and all that? Or are we going to look at Jesus with his kindness, with his integrity, with how authentic he was? Are we going to look at that as him as being the Messiah? There have been many, many commentaries written on Judas, and I've read quite a few of them just because Judas has always kind of interested me. And there's, there's this thought that Judas could not let go of that warrior image of God, that he kept hold of it, and that in his act of betrayal, he actually was kind of thinking, okay, this will be for the good because this will get Jesus thinking about um, being a warrior, provoking him into that. So Judas kind of made his decision, but every one of those disciples had to make a decision. Am I going to let go of who I thought the Messiah or what I thought the Messiah would look, at, look like? So we get to this point in the story in, in the Gospels. Jesus says, who do, who do you think I am? Now, there's no hedging here. Peter answers right away, um, you are the Messiah. But looking back at Peter's life at, and his following of Jesus, when did he make that decision? I'm really not sure when, um, but I think it was because Jesus or Peter kept himself open to possibilities. Jesus kept himself, or Peter kept himself open to the possibility that perhaps my image of who I think the Messiah should look like or what he should be like, maybe there's a different way of looking at that. And keeping ourselves open to possibilities is not the easiest thing in the world, at least it's, it's not for me. Um, he listened to the, the message. He got to see Jesus firsthand with the healing. Um, and he made this decision that, yes, I can let go of what I thought and embrace the Jesus that Jesus has given me, the Messiah that Jesus is. So think about this simple fisherman. He makes this decision. He didn't have 2,000 years of, um, com like I said earlier, commentaries to think about. He didn't have, he didn't even have the written word. He just had what he was hearing. So um, Peter, in making this, this statement, it's a bold statement for that time. I think we can sit, I can only, I should speak only for myself. I think I can sit back in the pew and think, oh yeah, of course he, he saw that. But if I were right there, if I had to make that decision in such a tumultuous time, I guess there's nothing but turmoil now either, but um, how, would I be bold enough to do it and to say, you are the Messiah clearly? He says the words. Somewhere along that journey, Peter was able to embrace Jesus as the Messiah. He was able to embrace Jesus' teaching, Jesus being loving, faithful, an encourager, a challenger, a peacemaker, but no swords, no violence. That wasn't who Jesus was. That wasn't who our Messiah was and is. So, Jesus was a change maker. We can see it in Peter's life and the other disciples' life, but a different way than many had thought would be. So going back to those early questions at the beginning of this reflection, have you ever held on to a belief that just is not holding up to reality? 
And why do we do that? Why do we hang on to things that are so obviously wrong? Or I shouldn't say wrong. There's another way of looking at it. Um, maybe it's because we just don't like to admit that we're wrong. And I don't know about you. I'm not a real fan of saying, whoops, mess that one up. Um, but we all do it. And we will admittedly say, well, yeah, we make some mistakes every day. But if I have to own those mistakes and recognize them, I don't know if I want to do that. So it could be that, you know, we just don't enjoy being wrong. Perhaps it's something that we believe for so long that it's become habit. Again, going back to those who have been um, abused domestically. I mean, they, there's this thought that, that's in their head, and it's hard to jump from that into a different reality. Uh, so, and again, it's like Peter, who had probably heard from the, his early childhood that the Messiah's coming, and he's going to, by power, take over the Romans. Perhaps our family unit reinforces that belief. For whatever reason, challenging the belief is just so difficult. And you know, I, lately I've been in conversation um, with many, many Christians who are older than I, who are um, trying to sort out some of the new things that people are thinking, um, new ways of seeing other people. And I've heard over and over again people say, it's what my parents taught me, it has to be true. My parents taught me that way. And challenging that, it feels like it's so disloyal. It feels like, oh my gosh, how can I let my parents down if I change? And you know, me being me, I've often found that the more I challenge some of the things I learned as a child, the more open I become the more um, I'm able to see different views. That it, and it doesn't detract from my love of my parents. It's just that we are continuing learning, not even as individuals, but as a society, as a culture. Think back to the way we thought in 1930s a, a good part of the human um, our, our, in our United States had certain racist thoughts. If we never challenged that, where would we be? So, Jesus, as change maker, challenges us. Challenges us to look at things in a different way. So, there, there's that funny mic. Um, so, Peter as I've said too many times, challenged what he believed and was able to say, you are the Messiah. And then, immediately after he says that, what happens? You know, Peter loved Jesus. Of that, there can be no doubt. Hearing, but hearing Jesus talk about the great suffering he is to endure had to be really, really difficult for Peter. No one likes to imagine a loved one in pain and being rejected. And then there were all these other disciples. Remember, beyond the 12, there was a bunch of other people, but the greater following. Certainly, Peter would not have wanted them to weaken or be discouraged by this talk of suffering. And in Scripture, it says Jesus was quite open about this. It wasn't like he was huddled over here in the corner. He said, like, yeah, I'm going to suffer for, you know, it's going to be bad. So Peter rebukes the man he just called Messiah. Wow, <laughs> that's pretty cheeky. Um, or said in another way, kind of human, the way he did that. Life, learning, isn't it sometimes one step forward? and two backwards. Somebody said that was a country line dance. Maybe it is, I don't know. Uh, we, our spiritual sports can sometimes come like that, just a bunch all at once, and then little bits afterwards. 
Do you remember the first time you really, truly believed in Jesus as a Messiah, as God, as the Creator? Do you remember that? Um, I can remember it pretty clearly in my life. And I remember afterwards thinking, okay, I've got it. <laughs> I've got it. I've had this, this wonderful experience. Okay, I've got it. But, I found out very quickly that being Christian does not mean it's a one-time deal where you suddenly believe, but you have to keep working at it. You have to keep challenging yourself. You, it, it's not a stop it, I believe it, it's okay. It's moving on in how we see the world and how we see our faith. So, I mean, those of you who are teachers, you've probably seen this with your students, one step forward, two steps backwards. Yeah, I see a couple of nods, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know, being Christian does not mean we are never, ever going to make a mistake again. If you believe that, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Being Christian means, yeah, we make mistakes, but I believe it also means owning up to those mistakes and saying, okay, did Peter listen to Jesus when Jesus said, wait a minute, get behind me, Satan? Well, he must have, because we have the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. We have the rest of the story where Peter is able to go on. Did he make more mistakes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did but he always was able to accept um, at, to accept his responsibility and move on with life. And that's what we're called to do. He, what Peter was able in this time of great uncertainty where the Messiah that he loved was going to be nailed on a cross, Peter kept going. Now you and I, we don't know what's going to happen, you know, in the next week. We don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. We might like to think we do. Um, but Peter reminds us that we don't have to have all the answers. What I believe is important, that we have the will to keep moving on, to keep challenging our faith, and to keep finding new ways to open our arms to let people in, people who may seem very, very different, dif different than we are. So this, this is all still relevant today. How do you answer Jesus when you hear in your heart, who do you say that I am? And all the questions the earliest, earliest disciples had are like, very likely our questions. Peter and the other, they took the leap of belief, the leap of faith. They saw Jesus suffering, seen him resurrected, but they were all human. They had to wonder, you know, they're starting off on this new endeavor. Will I be okay if I call Jesus the Messiah? What comes next in my faith life? Will I be strong enough, smart enough to carry the message, the hope of Jesus? Will I be rejected? There's not a one of us that likes that one. Will I still be loved? Who will be there to embrace me, encourage me when I fail? Those questions in real time. Because you and I, just like the early disciples, we are called to answer that question, who do you think I am? And then to walk the path that Jesus leads us in. You know, those of you who know me know that I've been a hospital chaplain for over 30 years before I retired. And I heard those questions nearly every day and often several times a day. So they were always in the forefront of my mind of how do we answer these questions. I suspect that each one of you at different points of your life have asked those questions. Will I still be loved? Will my family care about me? 
how will I handle this? Um, when I went to seminary, my sister and her husband drove me to the seminary that I went to. It was a couple states away. And I remember sitting with my sister, and she looked at me and she says, I'm afraid you're going to change if you, go to, if you follow through on this. And I can tell her with all sincerity, I'm so like, grateful that I did. I was such a novice. Didn't understand, I still don't understand a lot. What I do know is Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the one that keeps calling our name. Jesus is the one that says, out of all the confusion of this world, I am there for you. Follow me. Amen. Okay. I'm looking to see what I'm to do next. <laughs> No, I don't want to sing, and <laughs> you're very fortunate in that.
Please pray with me. Generous God, may these gifts honor your name and your generous spirit alive within us. We thank you for the opportunity and privilege of contributing to your kingdom and our world. Amen. the benediction of you as you go forth this day may you go forth knowing and following the greatest change maker of all our Lord Jesus Christ amen mm -hmm.